This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 476. The thing that I always say on the rookie show, right, is that, you know, and I'm sure you guys have said the same thing as well, is that real estate investing itself is not complicated. Like the idea of real estate investing is actually quite simple, but people always confuse like simple versus easy right? Or complicated versus hard. And real estate investing, even though it's pretty simple, it is very hard, right? It's not easy, but it is very hard. And it takes a lot of work to stick with it long enough to see the results. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from biggerpockets.com. Your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? It's Brendan Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, Mr. David, short term rookie green. What's up, man? How you doing? Short term rental, short term rookie. Very nice. Mm, yeah. That was I am good, a rookie right? in the short term rental game. Yeah. I I'm know. doing amazing. I'm co hosting the best and biggest real estate podcast, maybe the best and biggest podcast ever mm. in the world. So, how can I be having a bad day? Well, you could be hosting the newest best real estate show in the world called Real Estate Rookie. But instead, Tony Robinson is hosting that one along with Ashley. So speaking of Tony Robinson, that's our guest today. Tony Robinson is going to be joining us today. He's the host of the new uh, Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie podcast. That was a pretty good transition, right? Did you see how I flowed that? You flow like a river. I tell people all the time. Well, I got stuck at the end and it was like a dam. Every river has one though, right? Like it's either a waterfall or a dam and you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Or a damn waterfall. One of the two. <laughs> All right. We got to move on with today's show. Like I said, today's guest is Tony Robinson, uh, who is the host of the Real Estate Rookie Podcast on Bigger Pockets Podcast Network. And that show is phenomenal. And I did not know Tony's story very much, really, at all. I knew he did a little bit with short-term rentals, and he'd done a little bit with long-term rentals. So today, we dive into both those, how he got into the long-term rentals for no money down, de- some no money down deals recently. Like This is not like you know 06, 07. This is like 2019, uh, 2020 stuff. Uh, You're going to learn a little about that. You're going to learn why he transitioned from long-term into short-term. Whether or not you care about short-term rentals or not, Like that conversation is so important. Uh, You're going to learn a little bit of how to make a short-term rental business work really well. You're going to talk about partnerships, how to bring in the right partner, how to find them, how to vet them. Uh, We cover stuff on mindset. We stuff about how to find a great market, how to learn your market. Finding the market. Yeah, that was really, really powerful about how to learn your market long-distance investing, and more. Tony gives a great example of how to get familiar with a short-term rental market, step-by-step, super simple strategy. Yeah, and he talks about how to say no, like how to focus on your thing and to say no to everything else. And his actual like language of how he tells somebody no is so good. That's something you're definitely going to pull from today's episode. So that and more. Enough uh, chatting. Let's get to today's quick Quick tip. tip. All right, today's quick tip is simple. We need your help. You see, we launched a couple new YouTube channels here at Bigger Pockets Pod, like the Bigger Pockets Network. We have some new YouTube channels. So not, now all the content doesn't just go to the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel. We now have a money podcast channel and we have a rookie podcast channel. So, uh, what we need your help with is we have to get to a thousand subscribers before we can change the name to Real Estate Rookie, uh, and Real Estate Money. So, uh, what we need you to do is go to the show notes page, biggerpockets.com slash show for 76. And then there you're going to find links to both those YouTube channels. We want you to go there and subscribe because we got to get a thousand people there. So that would help us out a lot. And then you'd be subscribing to a channel that gives great information about real estate investing. So it's good to do it anyway. But that is today's quick tip. You can also go to my Instagram or David's Instagram. We'll put a link in our like uh, in our like our story or bio or something like that. That probably the bio uh, that'll link to that as well. So yeah. Anyway, David Green twenty four or Beardy Brandon or at Bigger Pockets. All right, David Green. Anything you want to cover before we get into today's show with Tony? Yeah. If you like this episode, send it to someone that you are friends with, but that is not into real estate investing. Just make Mm, your own friend. Send today's episode to someone who might be interested in it, who this could catch their attention, and you can create your own community. Mm, So good. Yeah. Because this is like the rookie show. I mean, like we were like, this is a show I wanted to send people. Like I even said that before we started recording is I want to make a show so that when people are like, hey, I want to get into real estate, what should I do? Listen to this show. This would be a good one to get started with. So send it to somebody you know. And last thing, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to give that little thumbs up button right now below the video uh, if you like it so far. And uh, if you don't, when you start liking it, give that thumbs up button and uh, subscribe to our channel, of course, uh, where you're watching it. So I think it's time to get into today's show with Tony Robinson. Let's bring in Tony. Tony Robinson, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. How you doing, man? 
I am doing fantastic, guys. I'm super excited to be here. I feel like uh, it's like the the freshman in high school who's hanging out with the seniors today. So I'm, I'm glad you guys brought me on. Mm, when I was a freshman in high school and there was a senior, I can't remember his name, but he had like white hair and he was really annoying. I was walking down the hall one day and he takes it and just like from behind books me. You know what that is? Where like you shove the books out of your hand. I have this big pile of books and they go flying everywhere. And everyone's like, hey! And like just a hundred people watched me slowly pick up my books and papers for like five minutes and laughed at me. So this will not be like that, Tony. Okay, uh, this will be know. better than that. We will well, it, it's kind of reminiscent because when I was a freshman, all the <laughs> all the seniors had much bigger beards than I do. So I'm I'm kind of getting flashbacks right there now. There you go. There you go. I well, love I, how Brandon's high school was so small. There was one senior in it. He said <laughs> the senior in my high school. It, no, this guy was like the senior. Like he's like the quintessential like uh, horrible senior when you're a freshman. It was awful. Anyway, well, I now do he wanna... probably rents one of your houses in. He Lanza probably Sano, does. So. Yeah. Who he gets the does. last laugh, Mister yeah. Books? <laughs> Let's jump in. I do want to apologize to our audience real quick. Everyone came on here going, "Oh, they got Tony Robbins on the show," and then they're like, "Oh, Tony Robbins son." But I want to, I want to tell you guys, Tony Robinson is so much cooler than Tony Robbins. Right here, you're going to hear it today, and here's why: because Tony Robinson is the host of the Bigger Pockets Rookie Podcast, and uh, you do a phenomenal job over there. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get our audience a little bit more familiar with you, your story, because it's pretty awesome, and uh, then maybe they'll go check out your show afterwards. So. That sounds like a good plan today, fellas. You get sounds with that? like a plan. I'm excited. Let's dive All right. in. All right. Tell us about yourself. How did you get this idea? I want to invest in real estate someday. I'm kind of fortunate because my dad planted the seed for me early. Um, I was one of the the kids like in junior high school that had to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad over the summer. Mm, um, so my, my dad kind of started me young. And he actually ran like a, a wholesaling business in Detroit. We're based in Southern California. He had a wholesaling business out in Detroit. Um, and he did it for about five years. And then 2008 happens. His business kind of collapses like so many other businesses. And the one thing he told me after that happened, he was like, probably the biggest mistake I made was not holding any of those properties that I wholesaled. Um, so he, he kind of imprinted on me early on that if you want to find true financial success, you need some level of passive income. So I had that seed planted really early. You know, I, I graduated from college. I'm like doing the whole W2 thing. And then as soon as I have enough income to actually make an investment, I go out and I, and I make it happen. All right. So what was that very first deal? Yeah. So um, in one of the most glamorous places on earth in the city of Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, most Ooh, people have probably not heard sexy. of it. Sexy. Um, yeah. It's it's like the number three biggest city in, in Louisiana. But I, I ended up in that market. Again, I'm in Southern California because I had family that relocated out there. And, you know, I was out there visiting people and it was actually my mom. My mom and my stepdad moved out there after they, uh, after they retired down here in California. And they bought this house that had been vacant for like three years. Uh, they bought it for twenty five thousand uh, dollars. They put another thirty thousand dollars into the rehab, and when they were done, the house appraised for about a hundred thousand dollars. And the coolest thing was that they found a bank that funded one hundred percent of the purchase and the rehab for that property. So when I saw that, I was like, hmm, something like th there's got to be something here that, that I can tap into. So I go out there and I, I chat with the lady at the bank and I'm like, hey, is this like a fluke or is this like a one off thing? Like, were you lend to anybody for the whole construction and rehab and purchase price? And she's like, yeah, you know, there are some, you know, structures that you need to follow, some check boxes you need to check. Um, but once she gave me the requirements, I went out there, I found a deal that, that worked and I actually bought two properties using that same 100% uh, funding for the purchase and the rehab. So that was that was my initial foray into, into real estate. Investing. What, when was this? I got my first property. We closed in October of 2019. And then oh, I closed okay, so. my second one in December of that year. Okay. So this, we're not talking like pre 2007 bank. Like this is like a modern bank is, was yeah. offering you hundred percent financing. Now, a lot of people listening right now going that, that just sounds too good to be true. Uh, like there's no banks that are lending hundred percent rehab and purchase price. So how did you find that? I mean, just because you knew like, your your in law or your uh, your parents yeah. had it. Here. Yeah. So once, yeah. once my mom said that that's how they did it, I was like, well, if, if they can do it, I'm pretty sure I can figure it out too. So, but, but here's what I'll say is that it was a, it was a local credit union to that city. Yeah. Um, I was able to get the loan from them because you have to either, uh, it's like live worship or work there. But my relationship with my parents, uh, you know, that kind of satisfied their requirements, but they, they had enough flexibility with whatever lending programs they wanted because they were small and local. So I, I went with it. Yeah, that's a really good lesson for people is like, when you hear things like there are no banks lending this way. There are no like you have to have this credit score. You have to have this asset. You can't have this LTV or debt to income or whatever. 
to understand that those are generally guidelines of like the big banks, right? But you can get a little more flexible with the small stuff, the small banks, right? Yeah, and, and it worked out great for me, right? And I've I've referred several other people to that bank as well. So they, you know, there's other investors that are doing the same thing. And I've since talked to other people that invest in other smaller markets, and it's not that uncommon if you do the homework to make it, you know, to, to find a bank that does it. Yeah, I think a lot of it, especially in the smaller, the credit unions, it comes down to like, yeah, like relationship, like the old fashioned way of banking. Like this is right. when they go before the board of their bank and they say, yeah, this is a good bet. I think we can put some money on this person and uh, mm-hmm. lend them the deal. But I will I will put the caveat that it had to be a good deal, right? Like yeah. it, this wasn't, you know, like I found a house where the rehab and the purchase price were about 70% of the ARV. So, and I did that twice. So it, it all starts with kind of finding the, the, the good deal first. Otherwise those numbers don't work. So for those who are, are brand new to this thing, maybe this is the first time ever listened to a real estate podcast. Let's take it to a rookie level. What the heck does that mean? A 70% ARV? Right. So when we talk ARV, that means after repair value. So after you purchase this old beat up house and you do all the renovations, what do you expect that house will be worth? Um, the, the requirements of this bank were that you needed to have your purchase price and your rehab be no more than 70% of what that house would be worth once the repairs were done. So at like a very basic example level, if that house, after all repairs are completed, will be worth $100,000, it means your purchase price and your construction could be no more than 70% or $70,000. And those are the guidelines that they gave me. Yeah, that's cool. All right. So what was this very first property? I mean, what, a single family house, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah. Single family house, three bedroom, two bath, built in, I think like 1955, somewhere around there. Um, hadn't been updated since 1955 or somewhere around there. There were uh, shag carpets, really old wood paneling, uh, popcorn ceilings, everything you think of when you think of a 1955 house, this thing had. Um, so we pretty much gutted the entire house um, and kind of put in new everything. Um, and I'm trying to remember the numbers here. We paid $100,000 for it, spent another 55000 or so on the rehab. Uh, so we were all in for about 155, um, and the house appraised for 230 after it was nice. all said and done. Yeah, that's a that's some good equity in there. So uh, can I jump in for a quick ahead, second, please. make a point? Yeah, I have heard stories like this so many times that are amazing that people never get because they were worried about the interest rate on the bank. Like, why is my friend getting a 3.2 when I'm getting a 3.4? We were mentioning that earlier. Certain banks will give certain loans to people under different conditions. With a deal that good, your interest rate could have been 8% and it would still be worth doing. And I just want to highlight that the the deal itself so far outweighs something as minimal as a couple percentage points on the interest rate that don't shoot yourself in the foot trying to win that battle. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the interest rate on that was about 6%, but it was also, it worked on a draw, right? So I was only paying mm-hmm. interest on the money that I was actually mm-hmm. paying out to the contractor. So it was like, I was spending maybe a couple hundred bucks a month for like the first couple, uh, like the first two payments that I made. And it wasn't until the rehab finished that I was paying somewhere close to like what a, a regular mortgage might be. Yeah, that's cool, man. All right. So let's talk about the distance thing. A lot of people, when they're thinking about getting into real estate investing, especially like in the beginning, they're a rookie. They're like, I, I don't want to just like, I can't just go buy th- some across the country. So I, I want to, what are some of the principles that work that you found work well? Cause I know we can get in the rest of your story, but while we're on the topic, what's worked well for long distance investing for you? How has that worked? Do you recommend newbies start that way? Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I guess before I get into like, what's worked for me, I just want to talk about sure. like the mindset piece first, please, right? Because please. so many people, I think, take the emotional aspect of buying their primary residence and try and apply that to the business aspect of buying an investment property. When you're buying your primary residence, you're walking through, you're trying to picture yourself living in this house. You, you know, you imagine Christmas morning, you imagine, you know, your kids' first Mm -hmm. steps, whatever it is, there's all these emotional pieces tied to it. And when you're buying an investment property, none of those things are going to happen. You're not going to wake up at, in your, at your investment property, hopefully on Christmas morning, right? Your, your tenants are going to wake up there. So the, the paradigm that you need to have when you're shopping for an investment property is totally different than a primary residence. The approach that I take is that when I'm investing, I want to make sure that I'm surrounding myself with the team of the right people that can give me the right advice, that can support me in the right way. Typically, those people that I have on my team are my property manager, uh, some kind of handyman, Uh, a realtor, and then my lending partner, right? When I'm shopping out of state, 
right? For every property that I've purchased, I've only seen one house in person before I bought it. Every other property, I haven't seen it in person before I purchased it. And the way that I'm able to do that is because I have the right team. I have my realtor go through the property first. Then I have a property inspector walk through the property. I might have my handyman go through and take a look at it as well. And if I have all three of those people looking at the property, how much value can I add? Especially if you're a new investor, ask yourself, like how much additional value can you add on top of what your realtor, your inspector, and a handyman have already added to that property? And the answer is probably nothing. Like you're probably not going to point out anything of substance that those three people haven't already pointed out. So what value do you actually have by being close to the property? What value do you actually add by walking through it yourself? So the the biggest thing for me first, guys, is, is the mindset and understanding that having the right systems, right people in place to fill in the gaps that you don't have as a new investor is the most important thing. So I went off on a tangent, Brandon. I forgot what your initial question no, was. So that's okay. Well, this <laughs> sounds, back this sounds so eerily familiar. Where did you get this information from, Tony? There there was this book that I read a while ago. I, I can't quite... No, no. So like, and David, we shared this, you know, I shared this with you when you went on, on the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, right? Was... I read long distance real estate investing and I read the Burr book when I was looking to to get started. And literally just applying those concepts is what allowed me to feel comfortable and confident, you know, investing in a state that's thousands of miles away. Well, thank yeah. you. I now know you actually did read them because that was a yeah. really good <laughs> breakdown of what's in those books. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, can you explain the analogy? You, you it told me one time this, David, and it, it made a big difference on me about the analogy of like going to a mechanic. Like yeah. Or opening up your car engine and going, yes. well, this must be the problem. What is that? Everybody thinks you need to walk a house because you're just supposed to. It feels like the right thing to do. And it's very similar to when us guys are driving a car and it breaks down and we pull over and we pop open the hood. Well, we feel like we're supposed to, right? Every one of us feels compelled to do that. But I'm going to assume you guys are like me that when I look at it, I have no idea what I'm looking at. That's the yep. secret. Like, ladies, we don't know. None of us know. And this happens to us in life all the time. We're just like playing the role of what we think we're supposed to do. But I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what's wrong with my car. What I really need is to get it towed to a mechanic. Like, I could just not open the hood at all. Just yeah. call AAA, have them take it to the mechanic, have them tell me what's wrong with their car. That's when I actually can make a decision that I'm informed to make. And real estate's the same way. For us, the mechanic is the home inspector. I can walk through a house and I can look at it and I can knock on stuff, right? Like same thing. You're in the grocery store. We all pick up watermelons and knock. Do we know what we're listening for? Did any of us grow up with like living in the forest, knocking on cantaloupes, trying to figure out which ones to eat? No, it's just we think we're supposed to do that. And I just probably faster than most people made peace with the fact that I don't know how this thing works. I, I don't need to. I need to see that report and turn every problem into a number. That's what I like to do. Oh, there's lead-based paint. What would it cost to fix that? Oh, there's asbestos. What would it cost to fix that? Oh, there's a foundation problem. What would it cost to fix that? Based on this report, I know what I need, the numbers I need to get. And once I have numbers, I have an apples to apples comparison that I can use to decide what my home run number will be for that property. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. And imagine if we talk a lot about on the show that almost every like judgment call that we make as people, it's really like an algorithm or a formula we are running through our head. Like whether or not to pursue a property, we think that we're running like there's something subjective in our in our being, but in reality we're just saying no. Like is the next door neighbor's house completely trashed and there is a bunch of like broken down cars in the driveway? We're if there is, we're like no, we don't like that. So what we're what we're doing here is we're basically taking what we might say is subjective or we think is just like a gut feeling, and really we're just putting like a math or a number to it. Like, does it check this box or not? And then once we do that, once we can formulate our thoughts into some kind of system or process. Mm-hmm. Then it becomes a whole lot easier or even better, you find an agent who understands that same system. So you rely on them because they've got years of experience. You don't need to build the system because you've got an amazing agent or partner or lender or property manager or, you know, any of those core four members, like they already know that system for you. So yeah, really good. All right, man. So you bought these properties. Let's go back to your story. You bought some of these no money down. I think you said you did two of them. Was that right? Of the hundred percent financing. Okay. So what, what happened next? Um, so after, after those two, uh, we got two more properties under contract in Louisiana. Um, these are really, really heavy rehabs. These are the first two that we bought from, uh, from wholesalers. Uh, we paid cash for them or like we used cash equivalents. We had some line of credits that we used. Um, and while we have both of these properties under contract, uh, my partner comes to me and he's like, Hey, I think I want to buy a cabin in Tennessee. Mm. And we're both in California, had never even been to Tennessee before. I'm like, what are you talking about? And, you know, he he says, hey, there's there's a very booming market in Tennessee right now for short term rentals. And uh, he actually 
uh, gave me the the link to Avery Carl's Bigger Pockets episode. I can't remember. Nice. I think it was like three sixty eight or something like that. Um, I listened to that. I'm like, okay, this, this sounds like like something real. Um, so we end up putting a, an offer in on a cabin, and lo and behold, it gets accepted. Um, we have no idea really what we're doing. We'd never <laughs> ran a short term rental before. Done very little uh, kind of uh, I guess educational steps before we put in that that offer. But we talked to other investors that were that were making it work in that market. Um, so we ended up closing on that in August of last year. And since that uh, since that first purchase, we've now bought uh, eight short term rentals in total. So wow. we've got eight right now with another five under contract. So we've gone just kind of head first into the into the short term rental space. Wow, that's cool. Um, how, first of all, d- how did COVID affect your, like, I know you just got into it, but how did COVID affect your short-term rental? Did, did it at all? Not at all. I mean, because we, so we bought our first one in August of 2020. So COVID yeah. was kind of already kind of, in swing. Yeah. yeah. And and we bought also in Tennessee, which honestly is like a, a bit more lax of a state than where I live here in California. So we had a pretty strong end of the year. Um, and then we got our first ones up in Joshua Tree in late, uh, late, uh, late fall, early, early winter. And same for those. Uh, they, they've been all performing pretty well. I think, honestly, COVID, except for the first like month or two, right? March and March and April of 2020 were, were rough. But I'd say once the, the initial kind of shock of COVID wore off, there was there was like this pent up demand for people to get out yeah. and go places, but still kind of be by themselves. And I think short term rentals have filled that that gap that you don't quite get when you're going to a hotel stay. I hundred percent agree. Yeah, I've, I've talked about it a few times on the show, but I'm I'm kind of testing out a business idea out here in Maui. It's called like a month in Maui dot com, and the whole idea is like people like are pent up, and they like a lot of people now are working from like wherever they want. So I'm like, why don't I just offer short-term rentals for a month? Like no, no more, no less, just you come for a month. And so we're testing the idea. We'll see if it actually pans out. I think it's going to be kind of cool, but it's for the exact same reason. I'm like, I think there is a growing trend or movement in the mm-hmm. world. And I want to capitalize on that. Is that what got you into short? I mean, was that what got you excited about short-term rentals or why did you go that route? That was, that was one of the things that got me excited is that, that I also saw that kind of shift happening in the marketplace. But I think the biggest driver for us was the cash flow at the end of the day. The, the first house that we bought, um, the first long-term rental that we bought, we were cash flowing about 150 bucks per month. And when I looked at the income that I was making in my W-2 job, I was going to need a lot of houses at $150 per month to replace my W-2 income. But when I saw the potential revenues from short-term rentals, I needed far fewer of those um, active and operating to be able to replace my W-2 income. So for me, it was understanding what my long-term goals were and then deciding on which asset class would help me get there the fastest. So let me ask you this, um, and I'm going to have you explain to us what the benefits of short-term rentals are. One of the clear concerns would be that they are a little more uh, volatile. They are affected by market conditions more. How have you hedged against having such a, a heavily weighted portfolio of short-term rentals in case something goes wrong? That, that's a that's a great question, David, and, and this comes up all the time. I think the first thing that I'll say is that when you when you decide to start investing in short-term rentals, you have to understand that there's inherently more risk than there are with long-term rentals. Um, you have the risks of the fact that this is primarily driven, at least in the markets that I invest in, primarily driven by leisure. Um, so if there's a, a big hit to the travel industry, that you have an opportunity of having your, your business uh, be impacted. Uh, there's the fact that you, you're kind of at the mercy of some of these platforms. Airbnb and Verbo are the, the two biggest platforms to kind of generate a uh, business force. So you have to understand that you're at the mercy of those platforms. Um, there's there's multiple guests going through, multiple people going through your property on a monthly basis, right? There's some risk associated with that. So there, there's definitely more risk that comes along with investing in short-term rentals. But at the same time, I'm approaching this not so much as a long-term rental investor who's buying short-term rentals. I'm approaching this as someone who's focused on creating a hospitality business, because if you purchase a short-term rental, that's what it is. And I've heard some investors say that you should never buy a short-term rental if it doesn't pencil out as a long-term rental. And I completely disagree with that. Because if I'm Hilton or I'm Marriott and I'm building a hotel, I'm not going to say, hey, we're not going to build this hotel if it doesn't work as an apartment complex. Like that That's not their backup plan. They're first and foremost in the hospitality industry, and their goal is to create like world-class experience for their guests. So that's the mindset that I go into when I'm buying my short-term rentals. But to answer your initial question, David, about like how I hedge some of those risks, first is that I invest in markets where the primary economic driver is travel and tourism. 
right? In the Smoky Mountains and in Tennessee and, and in Joshua Tree, where we have our, our other properties, the main economic driver is people coming into the national parks, staying overnight, eating at the local restaurants, doing things like that. It's not like Los Angeles, uh, where there's film and television or there's big business headquarters or there's universities. The main economic driver is people coming and staying overnight to visit the, the park. So that's the first thing that I do is I, I invest in places that financially rely on short-term rentals. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have some negative legislation passed, but it, it really reduces the risk that they would completely outlaw short-term rentals. Um, the second thing that I do is I try and make sure that I buy really nice properties, right? Like I, I try and make sure that I'm not, you know, I, some people put up like, uh, like glamping units. Um, and to me, that's not really an appreciating asset. So I don't know if I would ever build a glamping unit. Um, some people buy uh, Airstreams as their uh, short-term rentals. I probably wouldn't do that either for the same reason. It's not an appreciating asset. So I still make sure that the underlying like business fund- fundamentals of being a real estate investor apply to, to everything that I'm buying. Um, I think those are the two biggest things, right? <laughs> like, like we're trying to make sure we're in the right market and we're buying the right asset. I could go on forever, but I, I don't want to. Well, are you also longer. sort of managing your personal finances in a way that you can weather storms in case they do see more vacancies than you'd expect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've, you know, and we can get into this later, but like when, when I made the decision to leave my W2 job, I've, I had maybe two and a half years worth of salary, like expenses just like stocked away. Right. So if, if something goes sideways, I know that, that, you know, we've got enough cash reserves to, to handle those kind of things. And so that's what I want to highlight, because there are people that say never buy a short term rental unless it can pay for itself as a long term rental. And hardly any of them ever will. They're often in higher price, more expensive markets where the price to rent ratio doesn't uh, support it. And I just wanted to say it's not irresponsible to do that in the way that Tony's doing it if you've taken a means to account for worst case scenarios in other areas of your life. By living beneath your means, by keeping money in reserves, you've accomplished the same thing as making sure that you could use it as a long-term rental if you need it. Plus one other addition there, like I got some friends out here, Caroline and Mike, they live here and they own a bunch of, actually, uh, David, you know them as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But out here in Maui, they own a bunch of vacation rentals. And I was talking to them recently and they said that, I asked them how COVID, I mean, because Maui shut down. I mean, there was no travel for like six months here. Nobody was staying. I asked them how they survived. Like, oh yeah, we're profitable for the year. And I was like, how the heck were you profitable? Like you have no, all you have is short-term rentals. And they said, oh, we were just very aggressive on making sure that the, you know, 10% of people who were actually still coming to Maui, that we, they stayed with us, which means we made our properties nicer and we made sure our price was cheaper. And so, yeah, we were giving 50%, 60%, 70% off sometimes to make sure they were full, but they were super aggressive on how they ran their business versus almost everyone else who just hires some random property manager to take care of their, their short-term rentals. Well, when everything went to hell... Yeah. All those just sat Great empty point. for six months, right? So they were involved in it. And that's how they managed to make sure they were still profitable throughout the whole year. Then when things came back, boom, they came back hard. Mm-hmm. And now they're just killing it once again, which is really what encouraged me to start buying short-term rentals here. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, sometimes skill and hard work and, like, self-management can overcome. Uh, and not, even say, like, not that you're, you're cleaning toilets and answering phones necessarily, but just being involved in a business is a good way to overcome some of the risks as well. We spend a lot of time just like really getting to know our market, right? And knowing what works and knowing Mm, what doesn't. And I feel like intimately knowing your competition and how you can start edging your your bets against them is is a way to stay competitive as well. That advice is so good for short-term rental or long-term. Like know your market. How can you be competitive in your market? By being, by knowing your market better than everyone else. So you're like, Wow, my market, you know, three bedrooms are really, really popular here. Or, hey, you know, nobody has a five-bedroom house, but there's so many people out here that want a five-bedroom. Oh, there's a com- competitive advantage there. So we could add a bedroom, and now we got five, and now our Section 8, we can rent out for 3500 a month, and, whoa, we're cash flowing two grand. Like, knowing that, like, it goes back to what David and I always say. It's like, you don't just find good deals in today's market. Today, you make good deals. And how do you make them? By being smart, by understanding what works, by knowing your, like, that, those little advantages uh, and so I, I want to throw this at you. How do you how do you learn a market? If somebody's brand new to real estate, uh, and they're like, I, "I'm a I'm brand new. I want to invest in real estate in X town." What does it mean to learn your market? That is a great question. So I, I can tell you what I did and what I encourage other people to do. the The first thing that I'm doing is I'm opening up Zillow literally every day, every morning to see what's coming on the market. 
just so I can start getting a sense for what's the going price for a three bedroom? What's the going price for a two bedroom? What's the going price for a one bedroom? And over time, you really start to develop, okay, here's, here's like the average ballpark price I should be expecting for something of this size. Once you've got a, a decent handle on on the prices, then you start want to start looking at what are the potential incomes. So on the short term rental side, there's different websites that you can use to kind of gather that information. But on the long term rental side, open up Zillow, check the for rent uh, listings, go to Craigslist, go to Facebook Marketplace, whatever medium you want to use. Start looking to see what are the average rents for different properties. So what I would do is I would literally take. Uh, like an Excel spreadsheet or Google spreadsheet. And I would just start plugging in all these different listings that I saw so I could start tracking what the rents look like. And over time, you get really, really comfortable with what those different prices are. So to me, it, it starts with that, really knowing what the average sell price are, sell prices are and then what the average uh, rent prices are. And after after a while, after you analyze enough deals, it becomes really second nature to you. Yeah, that's really, really good. Yeah, David, anything you want to add on that about knowing your market? Yeah, and that's something every beginner can start with that takes zero dollars and just time. You go on Airbnb and you start looking at what the price range is at everything between, say, 180 and 220 a night. And then getting to know which are the ones that are getting 220, what do they look like? What are the ones look like that's getting 160? Then, like Tony said, start looking at the price points and start recognizing like where the sweet spot looks like it is. You know, if you're having to pay 33% more for one extra bedroom, that's probably not going to generate enough income to pay for itself. I think that a lot of the mistake newbies make is that they think that someone's going to tell them what to do without putting the time and the reps in of understanding what that market should look like. And that's honestly why I think people in our position are a little hesitant to jump in with a newbie and say, just go do this. Because we know inherently, I would have to sit with you and go through a hundred deals to get you a baseline for what you're looking at. And I, I can't commit to that. So then we end up just not answering when they say, hey, how can you help me with this thing? I see Tony nodding your head. Is that a, you feel that pressure too sometimes? <laughs> Uh, all the time, all the time. No, I, I just want to add one other thing, right? Because you, you talked about like analyzing for short term rentals. I want to share like the process that I go through for myself when we're trying to see, see like, okay, will this make sense of the short term rental? So there, there are some paid tools, right? So Price Labs has something called the market dashboard. So pricelabs.co. Um, and you can go into their market dashboard and they've got a ton, a ton of data. Um, it is a paid subscription. So if you want the, the freeway, I'm going to give everyone the freeway to go do this. So say so that you're looking at a listing and it's a two bedroom, one bath in the city of Joshua Tree, California. What I would do is I would go into Airbnb, I would filter it down to two bedrooms, and I'm going to look for every listing that's comparable to the listing that I'm thinking about buying. And I'm going to look at a few different things. I'm going to look at uh, the 30-day calendar. So, you know, in Airbnb, you can actually look at the calendar for all the listings that are there. I'm going to look at the 30, the 60, the 90, and the 180-day calendar for all those properties. And as I'm looking at those, I'm going to see what's the average rate that this property is charging. Uh, for each one of those time intervals, and then I'm going to look at the occupancy for each one of those uh, each one of those different uh, time intervals as well. Once you do that for like five or six listings, you'll have a really really solid understanding of what that property could potentially do um, over the course of an entire year. But it's important to get the six month because what a property charges in you know, January is going to be very different than what it's charging during, you know, July. So you want to get a right enough range to make sure that your average daily rate averages out across the year. So that's the process that I follow. Literally, when I got it started, that's what I did to, to get familiar with markets on the short term rental side. That's a great, great strategy. I love how simple that is, how anybody can do it. Yeah, really good. All right, Brandon, so what were you going to say before that? Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Uh, so today I was at coffee this morning and some guy like sitting next to us, he like turned around. He's like, hey, I know that voice. And he was like a bigger pockets guy. Right. So he's telling me his story. And at one point he said something that I was like, I grabbed my phone. I was like, dude, will you say that again? I just want to play that. I'm gonna see if this will work. I'm going to play it up to my microphone. Listen to what he says here. It's related to what we just talked about. Listen to this. Will you say that again? So we ran 100 deals and literally exactly on the 100th deal that we ran in bigger pockets is when we got our first investment property. That's awesome. And that I Could you guys hear that okay? Yeah, that came if through. If not, I'll, I, okay, I was gonna, I can, the editors can edit it in there. But basically, he analyzed 100 deals. In order to learn his market, he was like, yeah, I just like did what you said. And he's like, I analyzed 100 deals. And on the 100th deal is when we finally landed our first one. And uh, it just I was like, that's so funny. Because I, like, I always say, like, I don't know. If you really want to know your market, we're going on the numbers on 100 deals. And like by the time you're done with that, 
you're going to have a really good idea, a really good idea of what your market looks like. So anyway, just thought that was funny. Brand, I, I got to add one comment on there because we, we hear so often in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group that people are saying, hey, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've analyzed five deals or I've submitted three offers and I still haven't, like nothing's happening. Like I'm doing this all wrong. And we have to go in there so often and say like, if you've got to do like this guy, 10, 20, 50, 100 before you start questioning your approach. But I think people are so used to that instant gratification of, OK, I read the book, analyze five deals. Why is this not working? That they don't understand that it takes time and it takes repetition and it takes doing it over and over and over and over again. Like the, the thing that I always say on The Rookie Show, right, is that, you know, and I'm sure you guys have said the same thing as well, is that real estate investing itself is not complicated. Like the idea of real estate investing is actually quite simple, but people always confuse like simple versus easy, right? Or complicated versus hard. And real estate investing, even though it's pretty simple, it is very hard, right? It's not easy, but it is very hard. And it takes a lot of work to stick with it long enough to see the results. It's hard mentally more than it is like physically, right? It's hard to stick with something long enough. You know, at, at Open Door Capital, when we're analyzing these big, you know, apartments and mobile home park deals and stuff like that, and we'll get like rejected, like we'll go two or three weeks with nothing. They'll like, we'll go like, and it's like, oh man, should we change up our approach? And like, that's the, the team starts having these conversations and myself as well. And then I always remind myself, wait, 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 how many have we actually analyzed and made offers on since our last one went through? And we look at the numbers, it's like, 13. I'm like, okay, let's just set a number. We make 50 offers. If none of them get accepted, now we have a problem. Let's talk then. But until then, let's just stick with the process. And guess what? It always ends up getting another one. In fact, we went, we went almost a month with no deals and we were starting to, yeah, oh man, like it's getting a little while. Then we got two in one day. And we're like, all right. And those two deals were like, one was like a 400 lot mobile home park. And it's like that we were went from behind our goal to suddenly way ahead of our goal for the year where we need to be just by one, that one deal. And we got two in one day. And so like, trust the process because it works. Uh, it, it, get that number, set a number. Where do you want to be? How many offers? How many leads? How many whatever? And then trust that process and start tweaking it. Try to make it better, of course, but don't tweak it on your third try because you had three rejections. I love it. And so the same box. thing we preach all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Partnerships. Let's talk partnerships for a little bit. Getting into real estate, people are questioning, should I bring in a partner? Should I do it by myself? First of all, what are your, you've said you do a lot of partnerships, it sounds like. Um, and I'm wondering, when should somebody partner? When shouldn't they partner? How do you find a good partner? Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, I, yeah, that, that's kind of a loaded question. There's so much to unpack there when it comes to partnerships. I, I think the first thing that I'll, I'll talk about is like why you should partner. So I think, I think this comes up a lot as well. And why I partnered was for a couple of reasons. One, when I first started, I was still working at W2. So I knew I didn't have the, the time that was necessary to fully dedicate. Um, so for me, it was, it was a lack of time. Um, it was the capital, right? I wanted to make sure that we had enough capital to successfully go into this venture. Um, and honestly, it was just having another brain to kind of bounce ideas off of. Sometimes when you're new, it's nice to have that, that kind of sounding board of someone else's thoughts to say, Hey, is this the right way to go? And to get some of that feedback. Um, so those are some of the reasons that I went into it. And then the, the fourth reason is just, I knew what my, my weaknesses were. Um, you know, I know that I'm more of like the, the visionary big picture thinker. Like I want to move at a thousand miles an hour and I'm not so good at like remembering to turn on the utilities <laughs> or like, you know, getting the insurance set up, like all those small things. Right. But the guy that I partner with, who's actually my wife's cousin, he's great at all of those things. So, you know, he and I have kind of been talking before he had an interest in investing in real estate. Um, you know, when I presented this deal to him, he, he jumped in right away and it's been a pretty seamless relationship ever since. Um, in terms of what I think has made our partnership work, uh, first is that I think we do a really good job of communicating and being open and honest with each other. Um, I think one of the fastest ways to ruin any relationship, but especially a business partnership, is to not be vocal when one of you feel that something isn't going the right way. Um, you know, he and I are, are very quick to kind of call each other out if we feel that, hey, you know, I, I don't think this is the right move. I don't think it's the right thing to do. And we're both very open to the other person's uh, opinion. The second thing that works really well for us is that we stay in our lane, right? Like I know the things that I'm supposed to be focusing on. He knows things that, that he's supposed to be focusing on. My wife, uh, she's our third partner for our short-term rental business. She knows what she's supposed to be focusing on. So with the three of us kind of being all in our seat, that's what's allowing us to move really quickly. And then the third thing is that we've got 
um, especially for the when we bring in other partners, right? Because we've got our Alpha Geek Capital team that's like the core, me, my wife, and, and her cousin. But we also bring in other partners. And whenever we bring in another partner, we have a very clear joint venture agreement that we all sign that outlines, you know, everything, every single part of the partnership down to how we distribute profits. So when you have that clarity up front, it removes a lot of the ambiguity um, and kind of the, those points of tension that could arise uh, from from a partnership if you don't if you don't handle it the right way. That is so good. We need to take that last clip and throw that on YouTube or something for like how to have a real estate partnership because that was phenomenal. Um, what do you see as some of the common mistakes? that people make when they're getting into partnerships? What are the things to avoid? Probably just doing the opposite of what I just said, right? Yeah, so like yeah. not, yeah, not, no do, not, no, hand, yeah. yeah, not yeah. like not having those sub discussions up front, I think is the biggest thing. Um, if you, if you guys both are going into it with some assumptions, but those assumptions are wrong, like you're thinking that your partner's thinking one thing, your partner's thinking something else. And then when, when th- the time comes to make the decisions or the time comes to, to kind of uh, work through that disagreement, that's when the partnerships start falling apart because you guys didn't have those tough conversations up front. So I, I think making sure that you guys iron out as many of those sticky, kind of hard to have discussions as soon as possible is going to set you guys up for success. And then the second thing is, like I said, making sure that you're staying in your own lane. We didn't we didn't start off that way, right? There was literally a day where two of us called to set up utilities for the same property. Like that's how all over the place we were, right? So it took us a while to figure out, okay, who's going to do what? This is your role. So making sure that each of you uh, identifies and accepts your role but then also trust the other person to do their job, right? Like you have to trust the other person to do what they, what it is that you, you expect them to do. Um, you know, sometimes my wife comes to me, she's like the, the point person for dealing with the guests and she's like, Hey, you know, husband, this thing is happening. And I'm like, babe, I trust you. Like, you know, you're the person that does this part. If you make the wrong decision, it's okay. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll make it right the next time. But I trust you to to do the right thing or to make a mistake. So I think trust and having those tough communications, if you don't do those things, those are probably the biggest pitfalls. So let's say somebody finds themselves in an unhealthy or ineffective business partnership right now. What would What advice would you offer them to get out of it? What advice to get out of it? I mean... I mean, I think the biggest thing is just recognizing as fast as possible that you're in the in the wrong partnership. Um, in my mind, being in the wrong partnership longer than you need to is 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 so detrimental because not only are you now investing your time, your energy into this person, to this this business partnership that isn't going anywhere, but there's also an opportunity cost of you not doing something else that could be more fruitful. So, you know, I don't know if, if you got to buy yourself out of that contract, if you just walk away from it and say, hey, partner, you have everything uh, because I, I want to be done with it. I mean, that that's the steps that I would take. So whatever steps you need to take to get out of it as fast as possible is what I would do. Because I think what we see a lot of people do, David, is that when they when they kind of see these difficult conversations that need to be had, they start shying away from it, and they just hope that the problem gets fixed on its own. But in reality, most problems never get fixed on their own, and someone has to step up and be the person that's going to solve the problem. And I think you've got to have the courage to do that. Hey, one more tip that I found works on partnerships that I, that I've had a lot of success with and, and a lot of failures with, and so I've learned to become good at this. Is I no longer like partner with someone and just say, okay. Let's partner in this business. Let's build a big business together, no matter what it is, right? Because you never know how you're going to like working with someone until you work with them. And it's not like they're a bad person or a good person. It's just like sometimes you jive well, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you you discover things later that you don't want to. So now I'm always like, hey, let's do a deal together. Let's do something small. Let's try, let's f- see how it works, and then do another one, and then another one. And after several of those, fine. Then maybe it's time. Look, let's let's form a big company together and let's go take this thing to the moon. But. You just, it, it's really messy when you have all these grand plans and you give all this equity and you have this partnership and then you realize like five minutes in, you're like, oh no, this was a terrible idea. It's a lot harder to back out than it is just to like not do another deal together. So that's the advice I usually give people when they want to partner is don't think of partnership. Just think I'm going to JV a deal and see how that goes. So yeah, And that's how we started too. It was one deal and that's nice. what we used to scale to, to where we are today. That's cool, man. So where do you see yourself like uh, headed with, do you just want to, primarily the short term you can also do go back to some of the longer term stuff where do you see yourself going you know i've I've, uh as i've matured i've tried to not go after like you know have like the squirrel syndrome where you're going after all these different things um so right now at least for the next like five years like i I don't want to purchase anything but short-term rentals 
Um, we are, we are adding like a, a wholesaling arm to our business, but it's only really to support our short-term rental endeavors. Like the markets that we invest in, they're very competitive. So we, we know that going direct to seller will be beneficial for us. And then for the deals that we don't want to keep ourselves, we'll probably just pass them off to another investor. But for us right now, it's, it's short-term rental focused all the way. Um, the, the short-term goal for us is we want to get to, um, a, uh, a half a million dollars in profit distributions in a 12 month period. Um, so we're not there yet. We still got, we got to add quite a few units to get there, but that's the goal that we're working towards. You know, I really like that when you're learning a sport, like when we were playing basketball, the first usually week of tryouts, they didn't even bring out a ball. It was just pure defensive slides and running through the offense and these fundamentals that were drilled into your brain. And at, at the point that they sort of became second nature, they would introduce another layer of complexity. Okay, now there's a ball, but there's no opponent. And then at the point where you got used to doing that, it was, okay, now there's an opponent, but we're going to just play half court. I think there's something to be said for learning real estate investing that same way. I really like, Tony, that you're saying, I'm just going to do short-term rentals for five years. I'm going to focus on these fundamentals. I'm going to master this element of my craft, like this, this movement in martial arts. And when I've got this down, I will then consider adding on something else as opposed to I'm just going to jump in there and immerse myself in, in an entire mixed martial arts <laughs> background and be really bad at a whole bunch of different things. I mean, it, it's so easy. I feel like anyone that's entrepreneurial, you know, it's so easy to get distracted. But, uh, you know, I think the hallmark of a great entrepreneur isn't how often you say yes, but how often you say no. And, you know, I literally just told someone this morning, he came to me, he said, hey, Tony, I want to I want to build 10 short term rentals in Joshua Tree, California. Do you want to do that with me? And initially I said yes. But after I thought about it, I said, I've got so many other projects going on that if I take on this project with you, I won't do it effectively. And it's unfair of me to say yes to you because I know I won't have the bandwidth to do it. So not only am I super focused on short term rentals, but I'm also super focused on the specific business plan that we've developed to grow within that short term rental asset class. Yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah, the, the saying no is difficult. I like the way you just put that, though, is like, look, I would love to do it. But if I do it, I will not be as effective as if somebody else does it or if if I was focused on it. I just be, have to be honest with myself that I'm not going to be there. So, yeah, really, really good stuff. All right. So let's talk about finding deals. You mentioned off market. Is that how you found the, all the short term rentals there in Joshua Tree? You know, it's been a mix, right? I think as you start to build a bit of a reputation in a market, it becomes a little bit easier to find the next deal. Um, our first two purchases, three purchases in Joshua Tree all came off the MLS. Um, everything else that we've purchased has come uh, actually from one person. It's a builder out there in Joshua Tree. Um, and as soon as he's done building them, we're just buying them from him. Um, so that's been our approach out there. Uh, very similar uh, concept in the Smoky Mountains. Um, our first two came off the MLS. Uh, the other four we have under contract over there are also directly from the builder. So the benefit of kind of going that route, having that relationship is that we're not negotiating with other people or trying to outbid other people that are on the MLS. We're, you know, we're getting it straight from the source. That's cool. Well, you know, this, this brings up another question. You've been about you're in the two areas, Joshua Tree and you're in the Smoky Mountains area. There's a pro and con to focusing on one or two areas, right? The, the, the benefit being you get to learn that market really well. You get to hone your marketing there and all that. The con, of course, is that you're all in that market. So if, if something did happen to that market, you're just really heavily invested. So how do you balance that risk versus reward uh, when it comes to not just short term, but it could apply to long term as well, but between focusing and being good and having all your eggs in one basket? That that's a good question. It's something that we we ask ourselves all the time. Like, hey, what is the what is the critical mass that we want to hit in either of these markets before we move on to a third? And the honest answer is we don't know yet. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. Um, I can tell you why we kind of split off into two markets initially, and it was because we were having difficulties continuing to find deals that pencil out in the Smoky Mountains. So we said, okay, what's another market uh, that has similar characteristics where we can find similar returns that has maybe a better price point? And that's that's what drew us to Joshua Tree. We're having very similar discussions now. Joshua Tree is heating up like crazy over the last six months. We bought a house in September for three hundred thousand dollars. We could probably sell it today for four fifty, right? And it hasn't even been a year yet. Um, um, so we're we're starting to do the same thing. Like, okay, what's the what's the third market? So I think what's really going to push us out of the markets isn't so much that we've maybe had too much risk in that market. It's more so that the market is heating up, and we need to find another market where we can get better returns. Yeah, really good, man. I uh, I got two more things on the short term rentals. First of all, uh, how are you funding them right now? What's your what's your current funding process, and what's your long term strategy going to be? 
Yeah, no, good question. So we we use what's called uh, a second home or vacation home mortgage for all of these purchases. Um, slightly different than your typical investment property loan, uh, but there's some major benefits that come along with it. And you know, Avery Carl was the one that turned us on to this when she was interviewed in the podcast a while ago. But the the benefits are that it's for most purchase prices uh, a ten percent down payment. Um, as opposed to you know the 20, 25% down payment that you get with a typical investment property loan. The interest rates themselves are almost in lockstep uh, with a personal uh, with like a personal loan. We closed on a property in February at 2.65% um, uh, for you know for short term rental, which is which is insane. Um, and the third benefit is that they're they're almost always 30 year fixed terms. So every single property that we've purchased has been using this vacation home mortgage. And it's not like it's not a secret, it's not some you know hidden thing that you gotta be really cool or like buddy buddy to like you know most big lending institutions have something similar to this um and that's what we've used there are some limitations though you can only have one of these mortgages in each market that you invest in so like the way that we did our first few deals i got a mortgage in uh tennessee then my partner got one in tennessee i got one in joshua tree then my partner got one in joshua tree and once we kind of maxed out those loans we could get ourselves that's when we started partnering with other people who could come in and carry the mortgage for us and then we're doing all the all the heavy lifting getting the property running um but that's how we've been able to scale and, and so use that favorable financing nice so you bring in partners who help you finance the deal and do you guys like split it 50 50 or does it depend on the, is it deal specific or how do you, how do yeah, you, it's typically 50 50. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, the partner brings the capital, they carry the mortgage. We're doing all the yep. work of, you know, acquisition, setup, property management, so on and so forth. Uh, is exactly my plan with that month in Maui thing. That's funny. Yeah. We think, <laughs> yeah. we think alike, uh, <laughs> because the benefit of course, yeah. If, if you're allowed only a certain number of mortgages, so you just find people, more and more people you bring in that they can give you mm-hmm. the mortgage, you put it in there, you know, they help you get the mortgage and the down payment and you split the right. cost. Yeah. It's a, such a good strategy. I'm really glad to hear you say that. That's cool. And it's still a much better return than what they get if they went out and bought like a, a turnkey single family investment of their own. Exactly. Yeah. Like as yeah. a long term rental. And because you're managing the process. Yeah. You're going to, yeah, you're going to do well there. That's awesome, man. All right. Cool, guys. Well, uh, I think we probably got to start moving on. Why don't we hit the next segment of the show? It's called our Deal Deep Dive. All right, the deal deep dive. And I think David was on mute that whole time. I was yeah, that was bad. Man. Alone and naked. It was, it was very <laughs> scary. Anyway, the deal deep dive is where we dive into one particular deal that you've done and get to know some numbers on the, on the, in specifics. So you got one in mind, Tony, that we can dig into? Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about the, the first cabin that we purchased out in, uh, in Tennessee. All right. Well, that answers my first question, which was, what was it and where was it at? So thank you. <laughs> David you Green, go. you take number two. How did you find it? Uh, right off the MLS. So this was before things in the Smoky Mountains got too crazy and uh, it was listed and we put in an offer. Uh, how much was the property listed at? How much did you buy it for? So we we got it under, it was listed for $590,000 um, and we got it for just about that price. I think we negotiated about seven grand off during the inspection process and things came up. So right around there, but our total cash investment was right on the nose at about fifty $59,000. Okay. How did you fund this deal? Uh, so we use the ten percent down vacation home mortgage. Um, so you know, like I said, five hundred or five hundred ninety thousand dollars purchase price. It was literally fifty nine thousand dollars for the closing cost. Uh, my partner and I, we had the funds available just from money we had saved up and uh, took it down pretty easily. All right, and then what did you do with it? I think we probably know the answer to that, but flip <laughs> rental, burr, <laughs> vacation rental. So this was a, a short term rental, but what was what was unique about this property was that um, it was a it was a pre existing short term rental. Uh, but it was under contract with a property management company. Um, and we had to honor that property management company's agreements, I think, for like six weeks, six or six or eight weeks after we purchased it. But in the in the 12 months, like in the year prior, so in the year of 2019, that cabin had only grossed eighty thousand, eighty five thousand dollars gross. Um, and I, I might be getting ahead of myself here, but we're projecting the same cabin will do about $160,000 in gross revenue in the first year that we own it. So it's, it, you know, the, the person who's managing it and the strategy they employ makes a huge difference. A hundred percent. Yeah. When I had that short-term rental, like four years ago, I've talked about a lot on the show here. I went out in like Grays Harbor, Washington. And when I was managing it, like, I mean, it was, it was a pain in the butt and I was having to deal with tenants, you know, constant turnover and all that stuff it was really annoying as short-term rentals can be. And I was doing everything. I was like the it. But I was running it at 100% occupancy, pretty much. I mean, it was always filled. And then I handed over this like slick property manager that they were like promising all these great things and they could take care of it for me and get my workload down to zero. And occupancy dropped not to like 
80 percent or 60 or 40 it dropped to zero like zero not a single person rented it after they took over like i don't even understand how that's possible and they went several months and i'm like why we're not making any money when i finally like looked back into it um it's amazing how much relies on the prop the way you manage it which is why yeah this time i'm building an in-house team to manage my short-term rental portfolio i'm going to do it a totally different strategy sounds like you guys are doing something similar all right what was the outcome Outcome is that this is the best investment that I think I've ever made in my life. <laughs> I don't think we'll I don't think we'll ever get another because this is a five bedroom, five bath, twenty seven hundred square foot cabin, uh, prime location in the Smoky Mountains. We could probably sell this today for like eight hundred thousand dollars if we wanted to. Um, so I don't I don't think we'll ever get another deal as as good as this one. So I hope to keep this. What's the night rent on the rental on that? What's the cost to rent that? For I mean night? it it's it's going to vary a lot, right? In like you know January February when times are slow, we're probably around you know, 270, 300 bucks per night, um, during the like peak season, if you're talking like uh, November, December, it's over. There's some nice, we're charging over a thousand dollars. So I'd say on average, we're probably going to get somewhere around like 475 for the entire year. What lessons can you pull out of this deal to share with the audience? There, man, so many, I, I think the, the biggest thing that this one taught me was that sometimes you have to take a bit of a leap of faith um, in your real estate investing journey. Like I said, when we got this property under contract, we had talked to other real estate investors that were doing well in the short-term rental space, but it's not like we, we hadn't taken a course, you know, I hadn't even read a book about short-term rental investing yet. I, I stayed in some Airbnbs, but didn't know them too well, but we knew in a, and I think respected the opinions of the people that were telling us that this would work, um, that we felt comfortable and confident enough to, to take that risk. Now, also, we weren't putting up our last $59,000 to make this work. So if it did go sideways, I wasn't going to get like, you know, m- my house repossessed or anything like that. So, um, you know, but I think having the confidence to take that leap of faith is is the biggest thing for me, because once it worked, we've been, you know, uh, full steam ahead ever since. Well, appreciate it. That was a good, good deal. Deep dive. I think you got a lot of people's minds spinning right now on vacation rentals and they're thinking, wow, <laughs> yeah. I want, I want a bunch of those ones. So yeah, I just, uh, I need awesome. you guys to like bleep out the markets that I'm in. So no one, exactly. no one yeah, comes don't to go there. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think Joshua Tree is horrible. It's a terrible market. To go. Yeah. Don't do it. I'll, don't come to Maui either. It's, it's terrible. Yeah. Terrible. All right. Moving on to the last segment of the show. It's time for our famous four. This is the part of the show where we ask the same four questions every week to every guest. So Tony, number one. Favorite, either current or all-time favorite real estate investing book? Um, I mean, I feel like I got to go Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because that's like the, the Bible for everybody. Um, that was one, you know, like I, I told you at the beginning of the, the show that my dad made me read that when I was like 14. Um, so like those concepts have been ingrained in me for, for, for a very long time now. What is your favorite business book? Can I give a couple? Because there, there's a few that I that I really love. Um, we'll, I actually we'll just read. We'll yeah. <laughs> I just read Profit First earlier this year. Oh yeah, um, Mike McCallowitz. Mike McCallowitz. So yeah, yeah, that so was good. like a game changing book for me. We had been in, like reinvesting so much of our profits back into the business that we were like barely paying our like we weren't even paying ourselves. Yep. Um, so now we're we're like finally structuring the business in a way that it it actually supports us as the owner. So uh, yeah, Profit First was the, right here. There it is. That one. That one's a huge one for me. Yeah. Um, the other one that I think is really big is uh, the e-myth revisited by michael gerber um you know really making sure that you're being super clear on on the seats that exist within your business putting the right people into those seats um and then over time filling them with people as you start to scale so those two books i think work really really well in tandem all right what about some of your hobbies Hobbies. Um, I'm super busy, so I don't have much time for hobbies these days. But um, you know, my son's uh, my son's in basketball right now, so I spend I don't know an ungodly amount of time uh, driving him to training and practices <laughs> and games and things like that. So um, really, just kind of being there to support him and his goals is, is big for me. And then uh, my wife and I like to travel as well, so we're actually heading off to Miami uh, this Saturday. So we're going to spend a few days out in Miami. We're now fully vaccinated, so we can hopefully like high five and hug strangers again without being too too worried about. Well, my last question of the day, what do you think separates successful real estate investors from those who give up, fail, or just never get started? I I think it's a, I think it's a few things, right? I think first is having a really, really, really strong why behind you. Uh, Because everybody that ventures off into the world of entrepreneurship is going to encounter some kind of adversity. And if you don't have an absolutely you know, extremely compellingly strong why you're going to give up. And I can share my why with you guys, right? 
when my dad uh, was like an, around the same age as me, he was like in his early 30s. Um, he had been working at this company for two decades, worked his way up from like a dock worker to the general manager. So he was the general manager of this, this big facility. Um, without notice, the company goes bankrupt, fires everybody. So my dad, after two decades of giving his heart and soul to this company, um, loses everything, right? Um, we end up losing our house, right? We move from this big five bedroom house into this apartment, uh, you know, and just a big shift for everything. And what my dad always told me is that you never want to have your way of providing for your family be totally dependent on someone else. And that stuck with me. And I always wanted to make sure that as my family grew, because I, I became a dad when I was 16. So I, I learned very early on about the, the pressures of having a family. So for me, it was always in the back of my mind to know that I didn't want to be in a position where if the company that I was working for said, Tony, we don't need you anymore, that I wasn't going to know how to feed my family. So for me, that's the why that drives me. I'm, I am terrified of not being able to provide for my family. I am terrified of not building generational wealth. Like I'm terrified of not being able to do that. And that's what drives me. So to answer the question, I think it's having a strong why to drive you. Last question of the day, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, obviously the, the Real Estate Rookie podcast. Uh, we put out episodes every Wednesday and Saturday. Um, we just launched a, a Real Estate Rookie YouTube channel as well. So a lot of the content's going up there. Um, if you guys want to connect with me personally, I'm on Instagram at Tony J. Robinson. Uh, and then my wife and I also have a YouTube channel called The Real Estate Robinson. So we give all the behind the scenes shenanigans of running our short term rental business. Uh, so you guys can check us out there again, The Real Estate Robinsons. Uh, but yeah, those are all the places to find me. Well, appreciate it. This has been a phenomenal show. I think people are going to love this thing, get a lot of it. I'm going to send a lot of new investors when they're coming. I'm going to like, listen to this show with Tony. Uh, it's a great way to like to go from rookie to pro. So you're killing it, man. Keep it up. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tony. This is David Green for Brandon Month and Maui Turner <laughs> signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.